Welcome to the Leadership Labs with DeepRec.ai, a podcast where we delve into the fascinating world of deep tech entrepreneurship, company founders, and venture capitalists. I'm your host, Anthony Kelly, and I'm thrilled to have you join us in this exciting journey. In each episode, we explore the minds behind groundbreaking technologies, the visionaries who dare to push the boundaries of innovation, and the investors who fuel the growth of tomorrow's game changers. We're joined today by Dominic Kovacs. Dominic is a CEO and founder at Colossian. Dominic, great to great to have you on the show. How, how are you doing? Thanks, Anthony. It's a, a great uh, time to be here. Uh, I'm doing uh, exceptionally well. As you can imagine, with all this uh, generative AI hype around the world, uh, it's uh, a really uh, challenging situation to consume all this information and make really strategic uh, decisions as a leader of one of these companies, but uh, uh, everything is fine today, right? Yeah. Yeah. I actually, it was funny. It was this week as well, I think, or maybe last week, I wrote a blog on how uh, video games are probably the sleeping giant in the AI world now. Um, you know, we see a lot of hype that ChatGPT got. I know, look, language models are pretty cool, but as I say, just just wait until we can have an ultimate ending to to Game of Thrones at our fingertips. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, we can even have a personalized uh, snippet for this. Actually, yeah. I I have some I have some uh, like um, uh, hidden uh, hidden uh, needs such as that for for all kinds of different series. But I'm very happy to say that uh, we actually contributed to one. Uh, live action uh, TV series called The Power, which just got released on Amazon Prime. One of the characters was actually created with Colosseum. So that's uh, already a proof of the entertainment uh, use case and Hollywood with using this technology. Is this, is this Power the one that had 50 cents? Uh, uh, I, it's powered by uh, Sister Pictures Productions. It recently oh, got right, released right, uh, right. on the 1st yeah, of April, as far as I believe. I know there's a series called Power. I had, I think I had 50 Cent in it. And then there's a second series now about his son. I think that one might be called Dead Power. It could be, it could be. A, yeah, I, I, I think that's it. a different one. This is more like a, a, a teen drama, right? So um, with, right. with the dark aspects, but uh, it recently got released. Yeah, but uh, it's, it, it's, uh, it was a great experience for us because I would have never imagined that we could sell um, our videos for such high quality needs, like Hollywood producers are like extremely picky and have really high standards. And it's already approved that with today's technological standards, uh, it can be sh showcased in a movie. That's like, um, you know, an, an amazing, uh, an amazing achievement for the technology itself, in my opinion. I mean, yeah, there's also, also less line practice as well. Right. So. If, if the technology and when the technology is there, should actors be worried? I don't think so, to be honest, because it's just a, an additional, an additional step in the process. And, uh, in case like, uh, uh, for uh, various other movies where you have to make look, uh, make actors look younger or, or you have to edit, uh, the way they speak or maybe the language they speak in, you still need the actor, you still need the actor's consent and the actor will still get paid. But these are like, uh, these open up new creative elements and possibilities in the movie industry. Um, I don't think the actors will lose their jobs anytime soon, to be honest. Nice, nice. Um, look, I, I want to hear all about your, 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 your growth. What has been happening for you over the last couple of years with, with Colossi and how you've sort of developed your, your role to be, I guess, coming from that software engineering, AI background to now being a CEO, managing, managing business, managing commercials, obviously very different to how you portrayed your career. Uh, what you thought your career would portray, sorry, I mean, um, in your university days. But before we do that, I want to find out a little bit more about you. What's What's been your entrepreneurial drive, right? Because we we met back when you were going through APX with the Fuzzer, uh, which is probably four years ago now, so so quite some time ago. But you know, you, you're a young guy. You've gone from startup to startup, which isn't easy, even for the most experienced people. Uh, so yeah, where does where does the 
drive for entrepreneurship come from with you? Well, in the beginning, I, I, I wanted to do all of this because I felt like this is the way towards freedom. Um, I feel like that's like a misunderstood concept because if you have uh, a business, then uh, you serve your customers and you also serve your investors. So you're not in total freedom, as you would imagine. Um, not like uh, when you're working at uh, a large corporate or whatever. Um, so that's what drove me initially. Then, then, then seeing all these impacts, seeing, seeing uh, 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 the impact we make at our customers. Like when we initially released a uh, very simple version of our product several years ago, and people started saying that, okay, this looks interesting. That that like phrase drove me like crazy to okay, let's make this uh, interesting person into a paying customer. And I still remember like one and a half years ago when. We released the alpha version of our current product that's able to do, uh, able to create videos in a self-serve basis using generative AI. Uh, there was a there was a guy from a company who paid upfront one thousand dollars for a whole year, and I was amazed, like, oh my gosh, such a large amount of money for such a shitty product, in my opinion. But since then, I of course learned that if you feel like your product is shitty, that's that's the perfect kind of feeling because that means that you are doing it right, and uh, and. Uh, I'm all for that. Um, and these days, you know, it's always, always, um, I'm not saying it's tough to keep this drive, keep this momentum in yourself, but the fact that you surround yourself with colleagues, for example, one of our team members, Amos, just left university to join our company. He was here part time for like a year or so, and uh, he decided to leave his university studies behind because he sees such a strong growth potential in the company. And he's been an amazing colleague in the meantime. This this puts lots of responsibility on my shoulder because I don't want to I don't know fuck up this guy's life, right? I I, I want to ensure that this place is something that he can he can grow his skills uh, at and and uh, become an even better person. And this just also brings extra puts extra pressure on me, which is you know it's not a negative thing. It's actually a positive thing because it just reinforces me that uh, what we are doing here is something truly valuable and that's an amazing feeling. And I have another example of a colleague who declined the job offer, which was supposed to give like two and a half, two, almost twice as much money. And uh, and this colleague decided to join our company in the end because of the drive and, and, and the vision uh, and the culture that we are building. These things, makes, these things make me so happy, to be honest, that uh, I forget about all the challenges and the difficulties. And maybe one more thing worth highlighting is uh, I tend to I tend to visit customers these days in person. I truly believe in face to face communication, and simply simply hearing words like "this was a ground this is a groundbreaking solution" or or "this makes their lives less stressful." These are very strong words in my opinion, and and these uh, these truly keep you passionate. So these internal like. Um, Back, uh, internal messages and 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 uh, kind of communication from your team and also from customers. I think these two channels just drive you so much energy, and this this where I'm draining my energy from, right? Nice. Lots of lots of responsibility, but you, you are right. Um, I've identified Classy, and you know, user up there with. I mean, there are companies who say they're on state of the art, but you know, user are on you know, the state of the art of what is physically capable with machines. Um, before we actually talk about, let's say, your personal growth of how you've you've developed your skills from engineer into business person, I just wanted to ask, out of interest, so when you started Colossian, let's say like the technology, computational power, GANs, what was available when you started versus when you are available now, like, has have you seen like dramatic changes in in, in the tech space? Uh, when we started, like, that's kind of when the open source technology Wave to Leap was launched. That was like the foundational aspects of what we used, and we ditched the entire thing because it wasn't really high quality for us to work with. But uh, uh, even back then and today, there are not so many open source options. Uh, Primarily because academia thinks this is a dangerous technology to manipulate people's facial expressions, which I tru truly agree with. And at the same time, this is a very niche technology as well. 
so few people know about this in the whole world and uh, and uh, they are not really open sourcing it, uh, even the academia. So because of that, all of the technological development has to be done in, in, internally. And uh, and uh, um, I would I would imagine that it must be easier today than it was years ago to just kickstart this. But the entry, the, the barrier to entry is still very high. Um, it's, it's, it's very difficult, not like in other aspects of AI when where you have a bunch of open source solutions, even like products that you can purchase for subscriptions that you can plug in an API or something. This has to be built in, internally. I had, a, I had a very strange request from one of my colleagues. So he knows I talk to people like you about face scans, open AI, right? It's, it's in there. He was going on a, a stag party and he wanted to know, was it possible if they could get an AI generated message of James Blunt about about the stag wishing them wishing them a good holiday and a and a and a happy marriage. Well, and that's I, that's actually possible. When in the early days we were requested to do, to create James Bond happy birthday videos for a CEO, and and that was one of the reasons why we transitioned into Colosseum from Defudger, which was about detecting defect videos. Um, essentially. Um, essentially, uh, uh, they paid us money to create a video and that just gave the entire intuition that, Hey, why don't we just turn to this content generation side? Because there is like validation already that they are willing to pay for it. And we created a James Bond video to it for a CEO of, uh, of, uh, Telenor, uh, mobile telecommunications company, uh, uh, personalized message from James Bond saying him happy birthday. Nice, that's a that's a nice story. Yeah. Um, so yeah, let's let's talk about you and how how your role has changed. So you're now handling a whole bunch of different topics, right? You're handling more topics than one person should handle as it is. Never mind your company's extremely fast growing, um, and it's in the deep tech space, right? So a number of things that are just high pace, high volume happening all the time. You're talking marketing, operations, commercials, product, recruitment. Let's let's start off with, with marketing because this one this one amazes me and it amazes me for a couple of reasons is that majority of tech teams like your own at Colossian are are tech people, right? He's you know each other, he's worked together, he's went to university together, he's built a tech product. You launch a product to start to become successful. You then have to go to get funding, meet some people, and they're going to say, "What's your what's your strategy? How is you, how are you going to go to market?" And you guys have never been you just haven't been preparing yourselves to be asked those questions throughout your work career, throughout your education career, and now all of a sudden it's super important. How did you prepare yourself? to move towards this or make that pivot in, in skill sets? And what was that like? Well, tons of failures, uh, I guess. It's just kind of like a, kind of like a um, evolution, evolutionary step because you fail so many times that you start thinking, oh my gosh, should I, st should I keep failing like this or should I iterate something on my process? That's when we, that's when I, you know, kind of uncover the meaning of what even it, what does it even mean to have a go-to-market strategy? What is a go-to-market strategy? Like, um, took me took me from the beginning like one or two years even to understand. Like, to if I would be honest to myself, several years to fully understand what, how should I respond to such questions? What should I pro possibly tell the investor so they 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 understand it from their perspective? Like, they they hear the answers to their questions that they want to hear. And what should, how should I plan it myself with my own like uh, way of thinking, right? Um, um, this this was a truly iterative process. Um, if I I would love to point out to some guidance or just articles and even sources of information I have found. Yeah, but, please do. But I'm just I'm just trying to think back, and I cannot point to any that truly you know explained it. So for for many for many topics within marketing or sales, I I can definitely name a few resources, but this was truly an iterative process and based on feedback. Maybe maybe I should create some content about this at one point, but um, 
eventually I, I learned this through failing um, and, and, and also asking for feedback once we already had investors and, and understanding what they meant. What I mean by about all this is just explaining how we are about to target a certain segment, explaining the numbers they, uh, of the strategy and, and the whole acquisition and, and the conversions and, and lending of new revenues and what, what a go-to-market strategy is eventually. Yeah. Um, so, it, so, yeah. What, what I like about that is, is you can see clearly how your learnings, you might call them failures, your learnings were creating an internally built process for yourself. And I mean, that's, that's, that's fantastic. It's, it's great. Now, you will probably face the challenge at some point where you might have to go more towards operations, towards strategy, and you're now going to have to pass over marketing to someone else, you know, and you have your process, but it's very hard because you've learned it through, I guess you would say the school of hard knocks and setbacks, right? That yeah, it's, and it's not a playbook. You need to almost create what you've done and make it repetitive so the next person can just get it and get it how it works for you. That's true. And at the same time, probably this is why people say that, you know, like, uh, running your second startup is significantly easier. That's why probably people get such higher valuations because you have this whole playbook in your mind, right? Um, in my opinion, I was not so fast in the first half of the company's life in, in learning this because I failed simply so many times and I was lucky to have so, I, I mean, not really runway because we didn't really burn that much money, if I would be honest, but simply, simply patience towards myself, like psychological patience of, Hey, will this be successful at any point soon? And, um, and, uh, I think this could be even learned sooner. Uh, it just, uh, it's just loads of, uh, lo loads of like ignorance and, and, and not, not really conscious ignorance, but focus on other things that, uh, and a shift of priorities that I may have done in, in a wrong way, but, uh, my best advice is just to be patient. And uh, if you are patient and you fail many times, you will end up at the right place, right? Can I ask you, um, do you feel that coming from a software engineering background, you are tech bias thinking, yeah, the tech is great. The marketing will do itself. Or like, did you have a different idea behind it? Um, I think Ben Horowitz had this saying of first time founders worry about product. Uh, maybe it was, maybe it was uh, Peter Thiel actually, but uh, I, I like this quote that they usually say, because it's true, because first time founders usually worry about product and uh, not distribution and second time founders worry about distribution because they know the product will be done anyways. And even though we are an AI and it's an incredibly challenging field, I firmly agree with it. And in the first years of, of me doing this, I was so worried about product, not, uh, at, at distribution. And even today I find myself in situations when I try to spend more time with product that could be because of my technical background or could be because of this biased way of thinking, but I'm trying to force myself to spend more than 60, 70% of my time with distribution, because I believe we have really capable people and, and just, uh, a great trajectory of success already that's like paved out for the product to be, to be like, uh, not complete, but, but truly, truly revolutionary and, and state of the art. And, uh, I'm trying to force myself to not to think about product that much, even though we are a product led company. And probably this is because essentially because of my background, I'm biased towards thinking about products. So my best advice would be force yourself to think about distribution, to think about marketing and sales, because I find myself in situations that I always try to think about products, probably because of my background or interest. I don't know, but uh, this, this is also a major learning, I would say. I, I feel that that might be the answer what my next question is going to be, but what did you learn about marketing that you were able to introduce to Glossy and that had the most value? Um, I, I think, I think, um, 
um, is the concept of uh, channel product fit. Lots of people talk about product market fit and uh, this channel product fit concept was brought up like one and a half years uh, ago to me by uh, Andrew, who was one of our um, PLG advisors back, uh, back in those days. And um, I read a lot of resources about the concept and uh, it's all about the, uh, I think the, the, the whole initial days of marketing is about uh, uh, rule of uh, the, the po power of, of, of um, how should I say it's, it, maybe we could cut this out. <laughs> um, I will just restart. Uh, so the, so the whole, um, this whole, uh, product channel fit concept is about focusing your efforts on a single marketing channel. Channels are like PPC, uh, social media, or, or even, uh, partnerships or, or word of mouth could be a channel. Because you have such scarce resources and we made the mistake of trying to focus on all of these channels all at once with not even two full-time people in the marketing team and it simply didn't work. So the largest, the largest learning for me was trying to focus ourselves on a, on a single channel and have this bullseye mentality uh, with this bullseye concept in marketing of trying to test and validate at least two, three channels before trying to focus on one and then deliberately focus on that one and assess its results, uh, see the customer acquisition costs and, and, uh, and the uh, payback periods and, and, and ensure that you are focusing your efforts on making the single channel work. And there are loads of great resources about each channels, which channel is great for what kind of a company. So you don't even have to go through testing 10, 20 channels. And in the early days, it's primarily around demand generation. I firmly believe that marketing should be focused on demand generation in the beginning because you need validation. For validation, you need customers and visitors. And uh, and we are in the stage now where we also have to think about brand and 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 further stuff, product marketing as well, right? So yeah. I got a I got an interesting advert on my on my Instagram feed the other day. I, I don't know if you guys had something to play in it, or there's definitely some form of generative AI in it. It it, it clearly um, scans through celebrities that I like, goes through the database of people that they have, has a generated video of them. In my case, it was Tyson Fury. It opened up and said, 31, are you this old today? And then Tyson Fury said, dads, you need to think about getting life insurance. So I'm 31 and I'm a dad. Tyson Fury is <laughs> one of my favorite like sports well, people ever. I was like, Wow, my girlfriend gets similar for horse has her age, mom's mm. and an actor she likes. That is like channel marketing. It, well, I was just like, it blew my mind. Um, but that is obviously to a level of what really good marketing looks like. Um, Indeed. So let's go let's go around this there's other commercials that you know you've you've had to completely pick up from from the ground up right and i guess one that goes hand in hand with marketing it's it's sales and marketing how how were you introduced to sales i recently had a conversation with an investor who kind of said it's really obviously that usually the best early day sales people are the head of product or the CPO. I was running product management and done the whole product stuff for several years. And then I found myself in sales and it worked extremely well. And I wasn't really conscious about this, but I never would have imagined that I would be good in sales. When I was a child and, and uh, uh, in my early days of uh, high school, or whatever, I always loved to do these bargains and selling my stuff to get some more money for primary fuel for my car. Right. But, uh, but, uh, eventually, eventually, um, I always like to, uh, handle money and be conscious about my financials, but I never imagined myself doing sales. Uh, and, and eventually, eventually I realized that since I'm the one who knows the product the most, we are a product led business. It means that the product is above everything else. The product is the, uh, driver of value for our customers. Um, I, I, I found myself in situations when I started to sell like pretty large deals and, and I was like, okay, this kind of works. 
let's make this even let's 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 um, make this even work even better and started to read about concepts. I really recommend Saster. I recently found out about it in the past few months, and since then I read like 400 articles. It's incredible, very practical. Um, gave me loads of ideas. So with this way, you can just um, you can just um, even do sales more scientifically than you would at the start. And uh, this was also like try and error and just following logical reasons, uh, or lo sorry, logic logical steps. Um, when it comes to pricing and just selling an enterprise plan, even in your early software, I guess you have to just start small. And we saw this one thousand dollar subscription back then. It seemed like a huge number. Now it's like nothing, but uh, it's still a great victory even today if we can sell subscription for a thousand dollars. But the way you increase this and and have further uh, like uh, opportunities on the horizon is just by running try and error, so trying to increase your price. And in the early days, it's not a top priority to sell a $100,000 plan if your company is not targeting such deal sizes. Uh, the, 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 what you have to do is, is you have to sell, sell and, and you have to ensure that uh, customers buy, buy the, the package that you are trying to sell. And afterwards, you can, you can always increase prices and, and uh, run more scientific and, and validated sales processes as m more mature companies. And this is a process what we are going through. Uh, it's a great learning curve. Uh, right now, I'm trying to uh, teach other sales reps to do what I learned. And, uh, and uh, that's also a very challenging thing, but uh, a different kind of experience. Yeah, so this is, this is what, I guess, a couple of questions in on that. So you mentioned you sales also was a bit of trial and error. But now you know what works. You've started to do a bit of research into it. You probably have your own process now. You have your own introductions. Someone has a positive experience with you in a sales sales call, sales environment, conference. You have, I know exactly this is how I'm going to follow up. This is what it's going to be. Someone rejects. You then know how to maybe try and bring them back into the pipeline and three, six months time, right? You've, you've built this whole, I guess you can call it a sales enablement and function around yourself, just based on your knowledge. Yeah, exactly. And I don't think you need like, you need to be uh, uh, concerned about these process, processes because I was always so concerned that how am I going to do enterprise sales? There is Procter & Gamble, there is like Hewlett Packard. How am I going to sell them a large tier uh, when I'm like 24 years old and, and have no experience with sales. The thing is that you have to believe uh, in yourself. This is a very generic like kind of saying, but you know, uh, this is what happened. I imagine that is, I would... um, fake it until you make it. That's the sales exactly. phrase. <laughs> exactly. Uh, that's, it has, it has truth. Right. And, and well, I had to imagine myself selling an actual big deal to a company like that and it worked out and even I couldn't imagine that I, I couldn't realize that it actually worked out I was really surprised but that just reinforces you it reinforces you that you can do it and from then on it's just uh, a series of, of, of victories and, and by now it's just a piece of cake it's just uh, like doing a push-up in the morning right so uh, that's how it should work eventually right when when you were learning did you ever like randomly cold call your colleagues to see if they buy Colossian off you. <laughs> what you, you mean like from internally, like practicing yeah, just, stuff? Ju just like internal practicing. Cause no, I never did. I never ever did that. So I'm, I'm a bit impatient sometimes and I'm just trying to do this on actual customers. Um, it's a better feedback, uh, quality, oh. I guess the quality of feedback is better. Well, here's the next one. And I think you've mentioned that already. You want to meet a lot of your customers face to face. You want to do like that is traditional business. It works well. How well is being so close to your customers? How well does that benefit you when looking to acquire new customers, even in marketing, even in sales? Like you've probably heard all their compliments, all their complaints, right? And then you have a new customer and they're saying, what about this? What about this? But you, you should have that knowledge, right? 
Can you specify on the questions? You, you're asking about the existing uh, current yeah. customers, but they have requests or? So we'll just start again to question from here. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned you do a lot of your uh, customer and clients, you meet them face to face after you yes. want to get to know them, you want to understand that really good business acumen, really good skills, not, not enough businesses do that now. What, what benefits does that bring you? Of course, you've got, you can retain the customers, but if you try and flip that in, that knowledge that you gain, are you able to convert good customer relationships into future sales and future marketing tactics? Definitely. So there is this rule of thumb that every new deal above uh, $40,000, $50,000 must be visited face to face. I read a bunch of like insights about this. I truly believe in it. Um, and, and, uh, those are a must for a salesperson because it economically makes sense in my, uh, in my view. Um, but in the early days, of course, I visited like even a $800, uh, annual customer. I was just really interested. Why the hell did you buy our software? Like you mentioned all our competitors, but why did you buy Colossian? And, uh, and it was, it was also extremely motivating and insightful. Uh, when it came to larger enterprise deals, did the same. I think what I think a common mistake that I I see in the industry is that um, um, like founders tend to only meet either uh, with new deals, so new opportunities, or with uh, existing customers. I think you have to do both. It's really important to pay attention to this because uh, if you hire a VP of sales and you make the customer success report under the VP of sales. You will have no direct connection with your customer success team. This means you have no direct attention to the problems of your existing enterprise and, and, and client base. And that just makes you disconnected. This is what I'm doing really consciously that I'm trying to visit new and existing uh, clients and, uh, and the opportunities. And, and this benefits in closing new deals. So closing like large new enterprises, which is of course has a financial benefit right away. So that's really easy to under, understand, uh, I would say. Uh, when, it, when it comes to existing customers, if someone is facing churn, or even if you want to ensure that someone renews, visit them, them face to face gives such a giant psychological boost that they feel treated because no other software company does this, they don't pay attention to this. So even if the customer success manager visits them face to face, that's already an amazing, uh, an amazing like, uh, 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 bonus and, um, and as founder and CEO, you, you can also add an additional bonus there. And previously I, when I visited one of our existing enterprise customers, I had eight pages of notes that I took throughout the whole day where I was there. And it, just, it was just an amazing reinforcement for our product development team, uh, to our head of product as well, to ensure that they can work on the actual priorities. These were like actual pains that the customer uh, saw. And I had a bunch of new, like larger, longer term bets as well for the product, longer term features and capabilities we can develop. And that's simply, simply uh, extremely valuable. Uh, um, it, it's, it's, it's definitely beneficial in both cases. And if um, handling all this wasn't enough, you also uh, take ownership of of recruitment, um, obviously an area I'm very closely related to. I'm always interested to hear how how companies do this. So, how how have you developed your recruitment processes? And I guess, look, even it being, if you look back and you were to judge yourself, would you say you had a recruitment process when you started versus what it is now? How have you sort of upskilled and learned to make? or increase your chances of making better hires, better team fits, better culture fits. Uh, so I just want to uh, appreciate my uh, leadership teams involvement because, uh, because of them, like these days, these months, I'm not really involved in most of the recruitment. Uh, so that, uh, you know, like situation is, is not true. So I'm only recruiting, uh, uh commercial times for my commercial team that I am heading and also strategic uh, leaders and key hires as CEO, that's always your responsibility. So that's like a very clear thing to do that you must recruit the leaders of the company. Um, 
Um, I would say that uh, it's really great that uh, Imre, our head of engineering, is taking care of hiring all the engineers. We have almost 10 engineers by now. Shazip, who is our head of research, taking care of hiring all the AI researchers. Um, when it comes to the process, uh, I would really start, like, I would say that when we, re when we really started hiring was when we uh, raised our seed round and we needed engineers. And I already had a process there. So this was really, really early days. And simply by reading the book called uh, Who the Method of Hiring, I simply Im implemented the whole process from that book and it worked really well. And since then, that's the hiring process for the entire company. We follow that process and it works well. That's how we hired uh, almost uh, 30 people by now. Uh, so um, it, 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 it truly works. Um, what's... That, that is against the norm. So look, con congratulations. Um, most people... Most startups end up hiring people based on good feeling, right? <laughs> gut feeling is extremely important. Like I, I truly believe in gut feeling, but same with sales, you have to put a bit of science behind this as well, in my opinion, and process. And uh, and this just ensures, like, uh, like uh, that it performs well and it's well managed. Uh, the responsibilities are also clear in the pipeline, in the stages of interviewing and everything. Um, I believe that we could do hiring much better. Um, I saw other startups who are doing like this scoring based system on cultural interviews, uh, on, on technical interviews. Uh, I think we could do this much better, but I would need some assistance from, from, uh, from our HR team to build this and we don't really have the resources right now. Um, I think we could definitely make our recruitment process much, much better from, from a candidate's perspective as well. But, you know, it's priorities at the end of the day, and uh, uh, we will probably work on it in the next 12 months. But until then, we didn't really touch it, uh, yeah. to be frank. The, the book on that, it's actually, it's the one that I see recruitment process most common um, with companies I've, I've partnered with, like even like Delivery Hero, HelloFresh, WorldCoin. The reason why I say those companies is, is they hire at mass and they hire at scale. It's the same way that Amazon done it with the behavioral based interviews, the competency based questions, and it's all done in different stages where a lot of different people would take part. Also like the underlining decision. So if it's a commercial hire, right, it sits with you. At some point, they'll have to meet someone from outside the commercial team because you could be influenced, right? You can say I'm under pressure. I've got a big sales target I need to hit. I need salespeople. So you could just be like, yeah, I'll hire the next two guys, no matter what they're like, or I'll hire two, the best two out of a bunch. Whereas traditionally you would like, right, we have a minimal bar. They don't need this. They don't get left into, they, they, don't, they don't get to join our business and work with us. So it allows for, for bias. Well, sorry, it takes out the, the bias, it takes out the rush because you can't just hire in a rush. Yeah, uh, you cannot. And that's, that's when the worst hires will get made and then rushing the whole hiring. So you have to resist that um, positive um, paradise feeling when, you know, once you made the hire, everything is going to be much better because uh, it's a false, a false expectation from yourself, to be honest. Yeah. Um, moving on towards uh, so, some towards the end here, you, we've mentioned semi about like product market fit, you coming from product background. Guess what I wanted to ask is what, what skills have been transferable coming from a, a product heavy background into, into a co-founder founding a business? I think simply if you are running a, um, I think tech companies should definitely be run by technical founders who have a technical understanding because essentially that's the foundations of the business and uh, and it's just beneficial from a, a engineering technological and product perspective to understand the, the basic concepts and uh, uh, it just makes me m makes the whole job a lot easier that I can understand all these all these uh, advancements that uh, the team is making and all the challenges, not all the challenges, because there are like so complex problems that I really don't, uh, I can't understand it. I don't really have the time either to understand, but it's just this 
way of thinking that that helps at the end of the day. Um, other than that, uh, I believe we are still a very small company. At this stage, I must be very close to the product, very close to tech, very close to marketing sales. As we will grow and to 10x, maybe even 100x uh, size or more, um, it's it could change. But even at this stage, I would imagine that this is still a benefit and this is still a beneficial practice to do. Um, this is what I would highlight here. Nice, nice. Um... Wrapping up, are you ready for the, the quick fire questions? Yes. Go ahead. Um, what are your current goals for upskilling yourself? Um, I definitely want to invest more into strategy because of my commercial efforts and, and uh, my learning curve on the commercial fields. I kind of neglected thinking, sitting down, doing deep work and thinking about where to be, bring the company. I've done it uh, in the mid term past or something like that, but, but not so recently. And I realized that I must do this more frequently and blocking myself time and trying to have this kind of peaceful hours for myself. Um, that's one thing. The, uh, the other is that I have to, uh, I, I want to add a bit of patience to my kind of communication uh, and, and, and just, uh, um, understand like, like handling internal conflicts and just expectations. Um, I think that wouldn't hurt. Um, um, and, uh, and, uh, I guess, uh, I will now need to learn a lot more about recruitment again, because I will have to hire so much more senior leaders than I, I did before. And that's going to be a different game, different recruitment process as well. So, uh, I'm already waiting towards that. Yeah. Nice. I'll try and remember the name of that book that I, I read about uh, the Amazon recruitment process. I'm, I keep looking around because it should be here in my office somewhere. <laughs> um, a book, podcast or content that you would recommend to uh, other entrepreneurs? Well, when it comes to product management, like I've done the whole initial pricing and packaging based on Lenny's uh, newsletter, which is a great product management um, Slack community and newsletter as well. Make sure to check that out. Um, I learned a lot from uh, about marketing. Like I knew nothing about, literally nothing about marketing. And uh, uh, it was the growth handbook uh, from Demand Curve. Yes, uh, uh, this was very useful. And also MKT13, there is a newsletter, uh, which is a marketing newsletter. These two sources are great for marketing, in my opinion. Nice. Then Kai Poyar's uh, PLG uh, uh, newsletter is also amazing about the concepts of PLG and everything that OpenView publishes. Uh, from sales, I would definitely recommend uh, Saster. Uh, that's, that's truly awesome. And uh, I have also advisors who I'm always talking with when it comes to sales, CS, and support. Um, what else? I, my favorite book is this great CEO within. It's written by a coach called Matt, Matt Moharki, I think, uh, he's, uh, he's a great executive coach of companies such as Notion and, um, and, uh, the book is hundred pages, extremely practical, really dense, and it just laid down the foundational way of thinking for me regarding how to run a company without that book. I think I wouldn't be where I am today, to be honest. So that's a really great value and it's available for free even, um, that sounds like my type of book, 100 pages. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. What, what are your three non-negotiables when it comes to being a leader, whether that's setting up your, your team or setting yourself up? Mm, you mean like expectations or? Uh, sorry, your non-negotiables. So I guess you could, your minimum standards, three things that you say, this is the minimum standards that either I do for my team or this I, I expect from my, my team. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, I think, uh, communication and over communication, I, I, I feel like that's incredibly important. Like I really demand from all of our team members to, uh, keep communicating, keep using open channels, keep, keep putting information to public. That's like truly essential to uncover problems because we are paying so many clever people. And if you are not leveraging all these brains, that's not good in my opinion. Uh, 
The second is hard work. I'm a really hard working person. I expect everyone to work uh, hard. Uh, we definitely want to work with hard working people. And the third are um, um, agreements uh, and, and responsibility, uh, responsibility kind of. So if, if you make an agreement, if, if, uh, if someone agrees to fulfill uh, another person's request, it's really important that we can count on each other. We are an elite sports team here at Colosseum and we want to ensure that uh, we are surrounded by people who we can trust and, and expect things from. So if there are agreements, uh, we want to count on each other, uh, each other that those are getting fulfilled uh, or communicated, right? So um, these are like uh, really strong principles. Nice. Final question, Dominic. If you could do it all again, what would you do differently? Loads of things. Uh, I would read all of these resources that I mentioned like one by one <laughs> every article. That would be amazing. And uh, and uh, I would start with marketing and not product. I would definitely fake it, fake fake the whole product as a, as a whole use a no cost solution. And not I wouldn't focus on building. I would focus on validating, uh, uh, lead uh, visitors to a a newsletter or a queue or or, or a database to sign up and and ensure that there is like a demand before you actually start building and make sure to build iteratively. Um, this is my major learning, to be honest. Right, Dominic, it was an absolute pleasure having you on. Um, Thanks for that. I, I look forward to seeing Cassian's growth. I look forward to having you back in two or three years, if you'll even have time for me then, because I, oh, I, I sure. do expect you guys to to be up there with with some of the names, some of the biggest names in EU scale ups. But um, it was a pleasure having you, Dominic. For sure. Thank you so much, Anthony. It's a pleasure from my end as well. And thanks for the great audience. That concludes another enlightening episode of the Leadership Labs podcast. If you found today's episode thought-provoking and informative, be sure to subscribe to the Leadership Labs on your preferred podcast platform or on YouTube. Thank you once again for joining us on this journey through the Leadership Labs. Until next time. <laughs>